hello hello everyone welcome to the third episode of the center for international legal studies fall 2020 webinar on the history of international law today we have two of twelve founders with us we have professor b s chimney who is going to moderate today's talk and our guest today is professor james gathi professor b s chimney is a distinguished professor of international law at jindal global law school professor james gathi is wing tartley chair in international law at loyola university chicago school of law since july 2012 and i request professor chimney to please moderate the session thank you uh thank you very uh, much prabhaka good evening to everyone uh and uh, welcome to this webinar on twail and international legal history it's my absolute privilege and honor to welcome my uh, colleague in the twail movement professor james gathi who as prabhaka mentioned is wang tat lee chair of international law at loyola university chicago uh professor gathi has a really enviable record of scholarship on of scholarship and practice in diverse fields of international law uh, he has written primarily on international the history of international law international trade law uh, international intellectual property rights law and of course he is also a commentator on constitutional and other legal questions uh, in his home uh, home country kenya um uh it would be difficult uh, in the space of a few minutes uh, to uh, to to speak of the achievements of uh, professor gathi i may only uh, uh, i may only mention that uh, professor gathi delivered the prestigious uh, grocious lecture this year at the american society of international law and as uh, prabhaka uh, mentioned um, Uh, professor gathi is one of the founding figures of the uh, of twail or the twail uh, of the twail movement i may add that his contribution uh, to the twail movement is immeasurable uh, absolutely immeasurable uh, not only in terms in terms of the uh, his uh, scholarly output uh, and he's very very prolific as we know but also in terms of organizing some of the key conferences uh, uh, on twail uh, especially the first conference uh, uh, you know which set the ball rolling in 1997 at the harvard law, at harvard law had law, harvard law school subsequently he organized another twail conference uh, and uh, all i can say is that in, during the course of both these conferences i saw uh, uh jane smiling and going and, and passing through the entire con uh, 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 conference uh, so uh, uh, professor gathi uh, i'm really delighted to welcome uh, uh, welcome uh, uh, welcome you and we all look forward uh, to your uh, 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 to your presentation on the subject of twail and international legal history to which you have made pioneering contributions uh, the floor is yours uh, professor gathi well um so uh first uh, my many thanks to you professor chimney for that kind introduction when you meet that professor gathi just let me know <laughs> um my my thanks to to the center for international legal studies uh, uh, the general global law school and uh, to uh prabaka for and your colleagues for this uh kind invitation uh to join such an illustrious uh, list of speakers in this series uh on the history of international law uh it's also a great honor to have uh professor chimney be the moderator for uh this session he is my mentor and uh as we all know he is really one of the most respected uh international legal scholars and i'm really proud therefore not just to call him uh a mentor but a good friend uh in addition as we all know uh professor chimney who uh really pioneered twail in the real third world uh uh is a really humble guy uh so I'll not embarrass him any further um although i will cite to his important work as i go along 
I, I will speak for about 25 or so minutes uh, because I'm looking forward to the discussion. And I want to do two things uh, in this lecture. First, to indicate the ways in which uh, TWIL scholarship has intervened in discussions on international legal history, how it's been received in the mainstream uh, international law circles here in the global north, uh, and uh, to also briefly talk about uh, some of the gaps uh, in this international legal history and some of the things that uh, uh, could be done to fill uh, those gaps. This talk is very schematic. Uh, it's not intended to be comprehensive by any means. Uh, uh, and um, I'm delighted first just to be talking about TWIL without having to define what TWIL is, which has not always been the case. Uh, uh, and the most obvious point I think that uh, I want to begin by saying is that TWIL scholarship has been central to the attention paid to Eurocentricity, uh, to the Eurocentricity of international law and to colonialism, international legal history. Uh, as Bupinda Chimney has recently reminded us in the second edition of his book, International Law and World Order, a Critique of Contemporary Approaches, even scholars uh, like David Kennedy who are writing about international law before 12 two scholars like Anthony Yangi came along, uh, they never really gave serious consideration to the role of colonialism and imperialism in the development of international law. Uh, it was not until third world scholars uh, started producing this scholarship on the relationship between imperialism and international law that uh, scholars like David Kennedy and Marty Koskiniemi began writing about it. And in fact, uh, I would highly recommend anyone who wants to see what the real history about the trajectory of the writing of the history of colonialism and international law is to look at Bupinda Chimney's book, uh, particularly uh, pages 320 to 356 to be very specific. Um, as Karen Mickelson argues, history is the most fundamental element of a third world approach to international law. Twelve scholars have shown how colonial expansion was facilitated by a Eurocentric international law that under the guise of Eurocentricity sought to incorporate non-European peoples in what was invariably a process of subordinating, colonizing, pillaging non-European peoples and their wealth. Twelve scholars have argued that international law arose in large part to facilitate the acquisition of non-European territories and to guarantee regimes of international economic law to protect the commerce and commercial routes that brought raw materials from the non-European world to the European world. Anthony Ange's book, Imperialism, Sovereignty and the Making of International Law is the leading tool text revising mainstream international legal history. Angi traces how sovereignty was used in the history of international law as a mechanism of exclusion of non-European society from the realm of sovereignty and power. This he argues uh, was possible because at the center of this analytical framework was the dynamic of difference between European and uncivilized and barbaric non-European peoples. That was the central question addressed by natural law and positivist jurists, and that still continues to animate contemporary scholars. In so doing, Angie shows how early international law publicists, such as Victoria, justified the right of European states to, to hospitality and to engage with trade with non-European peoples to, re, to repair the failure, um, and how they invoked one co conquest against non-European peoples to repair failure to respect those rights. These early natural law, law prerogatives of European states and traders were then embedded in treaties, including those on capitulations and transfer of territory to European states in the positivist era of international law in the 19th and 20th centuries. Angi argues that the vestiges of colonial prerogatives, such as looking over the welfare of non-European peoples embodied in the League of Nations mandate system was carried forward in the United Nations systems through the system of trusteeships. Other scholars such as Mohammed Shahabuddin have further complicated this retelling of the history of international law by emphasizing the variety of European colonialisms. Uh, for example, contrasting the French liberal variety that presupposed the need to assimilate African uh, colonial subject, subjects as a pathway to civilizing them. And that of German ethno-nationalism 
that was based on the suppression of races and of German ethnic and racial superiority over its non-European colonial subjects. Twelve scholars have also emphasized how third world scholars, leaders and diplomats reformulated traditional doctrines of international law to suit the circumstances and interests of the periphery. For example, the first post-independence president of then Tanganyika advanced the Nyerere doctrine of state succession according to which colonial treaties would be reviewed and only those uh, that were consistent with that country's interests would be continued while the rest would be repudiated. A particular feature of history centrality in tour scholarship therefore is the tracing of continuities of coloniality in modern international law as falling into a distinct past and a contemporary present. Rather, Twill scholarship argues that international law still carries within it a strong legacy of repression of third world states and peoples. Examples of such continuities include, of course, the composition of the UN Security Council with the five veto wielding permanent members, the weighted voting system of the Bretton Woods institutions that gives the world's richest economies the power to set the economic agenda of the former colonies, the rules of customary international law, such as Pacta Sun Savanda, that bind former colonized countries to comply with treaties uh, and of course, customary international law, uh, even though they took no part in their formulation or formation. Uh, and the fact that self-determination retained the subordinate dependent position of third world elites uh, to their former colonial powers and to multinational uh, corporate interests. For Twilers, international legal history is therefore not a linear progress narrative in which order overcame chaos or in which renewal overcomes the blemishes of the past. There are many other great examples of twill international legal history uh, from Karen Mickelson's excellent retelling of international environmental law to Bupinda Chimney's compelling account of the contemporaneous rise of capitalism and customer international law. A recent book edited by Marco Michael Fakhri, Vasuki Nesia, and Luis Eslava on legacies of the Bandung Conference of 1955 dares to imagine a non-dominant, non-elite uh, international law. Um, and uh, according to uh, Vasuki and uh, uh, Michael Fakhri, um, uh, in this retelling of international legal history, such a non-dominant international legal order is possible uh, if we tell the history of international law, not from the perspective uh, as is often done of uh, the global north in uh, the way in which it's told in the textbooks and case books and articles of international law. Uh, and the way to do that is uh, through the types of uh, histories that we have seen produced uh, by scholars uh, in the third world tradition. Uh, so retelling international law from such a view of the third world focuses on how it matters for the majority of the people of uh, the world. People often subordinated in multiple ways by their states in conjunction with international institutions, global capital and so on. Twelve scholars are therefore able to simultaneously challenge views of colonialism being a thing of the past that are disciplined sometimes too quickly assumes by exposing their uncanny colonial continuities in the present, while at the same time seeking reform of international law and seeing its utility uh, and using it in promoting uh, change. In short, Twelve's agenda therefore has been that of uncovering international, how international law obscures its colonial and racist history, but also the ongoing legacies of racial oppression and disparity embedded within its rules and doctrines. Twelve scholars therefore join anti-colonial scholars and practitioners such as Amy Cicer, Amilcar Cabral and Franz Fanon who remind us that willful amnesia sits at the heart of the colonial project because it sanctions the idea not only that the world is post-colonial and post-racial but also that the long history of colonialism racialized indentured servitude, indigenous genocide and transatlantic slavery have left no traces in culture, language, knowledge or, or knowledge production. So one of the gaps. So scholars studying indigenous, indigenous peoples in international law have critiqued twelve scholarship for not having an adequate theory of subordination as reflected by the failure of twelve scholarship to adequately address the concerns of indigenous peoples. 
Amar Batia, for example, makes the case that there is an absence of indigenous peoples in Twill's retelling of international legal history because it embraces the solidarity of states, uh, uh, the Asian states, the African states, and so on and so forth, while ignoring and subsuming, subsuming within that history the indigenous peoples and their legal traditions and practices. By examining the multidimensional nature of colonial subordination to include indigenous peoples, scholars like Batia offer a corrective to decolonizing movements and their attendant scholarship that in his view embraced assimilationist goals inconsistent with the interests of indigenous peoples. Mark Macmillan's scholarship on the indigenous Australian nations is another example that challenges the boundaries of how Western international law both tells histories of international law, including its also, but also about how indigenous peoples uh, had different laws, different registers of relationships than those encoded in Western international law. Twelve scholars who examine indigenous peoples show how, uh, therefore, how these uh, non-Western states, and as well as the settler uh, uh, states in the global north, like the United States, Canada, and New Zealand, and Australia, subordinate indigenous peoples, their experiences, their histories, and their different understandings of international law. This has until recently not been a major theme in international legal history. Another major gap in international legal history is a full and honest acknowledgement of slavery and its aftermath. Slavery and its racist underpinnings do not feature in any significant way in mainstream accounts of international law. In critical circles, Henry Richardson III's important scholarship challenges how international legal history scrubbed clean the history of racial oppression and the massiveness, as he says, of the slave system since before the beginning of the American Republic, and how that system and the accompanying history uh, sought um, show how African Americans lack talent and public competence and praiseworthy public attributes. His book, The Origins of African American Interest in International Law, is an excellent example of international law scholarship that recovers the epistemic silencing of African Americans in international law. Um, and you know, this book, uh, in a very significant way, looks to different sources uh, to uncover that history than the sources that we in international law uh, rely on. Twelve's international legal agenda, therefore, has been that of resistance to and agitation against alien racists and colonial rule while acknowledging the limitations uh, of uh, post-colonial rule um, and uh, the limitations of self-determination. Um, and one other way we might think about this is, uh, as Fasuki Nasser reminds us, that you know, the agenda of 12 scholars uh, is that of uh, a rebel imagination of the plural ways in which the promise of international law can be margined. You know, the isolated rebel imaginations of first generation 12 scholars and the more concerted scholarship of current day 12 scholars and practitioners uh, is part of a larger protected ongoing struggle against Eurocentric international law uh, and ways to overcome and to remake it. But there are gaps, like I have said. Another gap uh, is uh, exploring the gendered construction of the state. Uh, and the, perhaps we might learn from some of the leading uh, comparative law scholars like Temu Rus uh, Ruskola, uh, who examines the normative masculinity of the state. Uh, and how the normative masculinity of the Western state is often counterposed to uh, the non-Western states uh, uh, as uh, having some kind of a deviant uh, uh, masculinity uh, and that then justifies uh, a kind of uh, conquest or rule over. Um, so <clears throat> let me now um, after having identified some of the gaps and some of the efforts that have been done to overcome these gaps, uh, talk briefly about how some of this international legal history by two scholars have, has been received in mainstream legal circles, such as the leading journals um, and the leading case books that are used in uh, the teaching of international law in many places in the global south. One response has just been radio silence. <laughs> 
just nothing about it, as if nothing happened, you know, as if all the major theoretical and doctrinal uh, challenges unleashed by the retelling of this history of international law did not take place. Again, I can't emphasize enough, uh, you know, I do highly recommend uh, Chimney's book, uh, International Law and World Order, Critique of Ten Contemporary Approaches, who really tells this story uh, about radio silence, uh, uh, about the work uh, of uh, Twill and international legal history. Another response you see in international law case is a short excerpt. So they go beyond the radio silence, a short excerpt, like, you know, maybe a paragraph from uh, Anthony Angie's book uh, at the very beginning um, that disrupts just very momentarily uh, the mainstream Eurocentric story of international law as having arisen in Europe. Uh, here, uh, this twill uh, scholarship is used as an adornment, you know, as a decoration. It's a checkmark. Uh, it's a checkmark approach um, that, uh, uh, like I said, uh, is put right in the middle of uh, the Eurocentric history uh, of international law and nothing more. Another response is to dismiss Twell's rereading of international legal history uh, as a methodologically inadequate uh, approach. And here, uh, uh, the example I want to use is the example uh, some of the historians uh, who have argued that scholars have committed the sin of anachronism. That is the supposed failure of Twell scholars to establish that colonialism played a central ro role in the construction of international law. In their view, uh, Twelve scholars anachronistically project back to early international law, their false uh, view of international law as united by colonialism and empire, rather than as the mainstream story tells us, you know, as a story of overcoming chaos and instituting order and progress. Um, and Offward has uh, provided a powerful rejoinder to this claim. I'll simply note that the central twill task of unearthing international law's colonial roots diverges significantly from the task of historians who are concerned with getting their method right. For twill, since the past is not a dead relic, then the type of acoustic separation between the past and present that these historians demand simply misconceives both how the law works and the enterprise of the legal scholar. Uh, scholar. As Anne Offwood argues, international law requires attention to the movement of meaning. International law is inherently gene genealogical, depending as it does on the transmission of concepts, languages, norms across time and space. The past, far from being gone, is constantly being retrieved as a source or rationalization of present obligation. Uh, and you know, I could give other examples. You also see this response of dismissal or rejection uh, by the historian Lauren Benton in a recent article, Beyond Anachronism, Histories of International Law and Global Legal Politics. This is published in the Journal of International, uh, Journal of uh, the History of International Law in 2019. And it's really appalling. She says several times that um, the so-called third world scholars, more than once, the so-called approaches to international law. Um, I need not say anything more. Such a dismissive attitude uh, is rather problematic. Um, finally, uh, on this point, you may ask, well, what about comparative international law? Does it not correct for the absence of non-Western views of international law? After all, comparative international law challenges the presumed universality of international law because it takes into account the different understandings of our particular rule or regime uh, of international law and its applications is understood by actors in different countries and regions. As important as the comparative international law intervention has been in my view, it falls short of capturing the unique epistemic vision of a third world approach. This is because as I understand it, comparative international law invites scholars to provide local expertise of their regions. So the question in comparative international law might be how a particular rule of international law manifests itself in Africa, in the Middle East, in the South Pacific, in Asia, in Latin America, and so on. The assumption in this project of seeking regional perspectives 
is to compare the particularities of a rule or doctrine of international law in different countries and regions. We've seen, for example, a recent book with more than 40 chapters on comparative foreign relations law that has, uh, in my view, nothing, takes into account nothing about the, the, the doctrinal developments, uh, the significant doctrinal developments that have come from uh, the retelling of international legal history. In so doing, comparative international law comes with the danger that it could cabin and peripheralize, peripheralize those regions as marginal since they can only provide expertise on regional particularities. They can only show how things are done differently in different places, the regions, the areas. This regional scholarship in a sense uh, valorizes in the name of difference, the very project of colonial rule. Such an approach comes with the likelihood it would designate as outsiders, as native, the views from the regions or the country reports. This process reifies the emphasis uh, um, that reifies the area or regional or country differences um, in a way that legitimates a coherent Western European white center. This center becomes the reference point for how to understand, see, and measure the area or the region. From this perspective, the role of regional expertise is to correct for the representation of Europe and North America, very much like the adornment, the decoration. Uh, and then let's move on. Such appeals to authenticity of the periphery is, in my view, very problematic, especially because they replay the tropes of international law as a non-Western construct, as an approach that typecasts how to think of our discipline in purely regional terms comes with the danger of, as I said, typecasting scholars and practitioners to play the role of the other. That is, to have a voice only as an expert uh, in your area or region. Well, it's important to have area and regional studies because they otherwise, you know, because we otherwise have one size fits all field where everything uh, uh, is flattened. We should be aware of the limitations of that approach. That is why a third world approach creates spaces for voices from a third world perspective that does not place at its point of, it, of departure. Uh, a view from the third world as a geographical space that is fixed or coherent, that is historically fixed in time, or that supposedly represents a true essence of the third world. Neither is it a view based on third world statehood. After all, many third world scholars, including Macau, Mutua, Bureau, Carrefour in the African context, Liliana Obregon, Anulf, Becca, Loka in the Latin American con context, have in their own different ways shown the limitations of such an approach. Uh, rather, as I end, the use of the term third world is an anti-subordinating term whose goal or aim is to disrupt and hopefully dismantle the hierarchies on which an equal production about the knowledge of international law it produce, is produced. It provides the analytical tools to examine whether there are an equal economic, political, military, or even racist underpinnings of the various rules of international law and its history. So in concluding, I want to emphasize that uh, as my ongoing work on international legal history in Africa shows, uh, 12 approaches to international legal history have unlimited potential. You know, for example, I'd love to continue exploring the intersections that my work about the various approaches to international legal history in Africa have with those of my colleagues in Latin America, uh, in particular the work, for example, of Liliana Obregon. Uh, and her explorations uh, in a similar uh, context. As I, as I go backward to try and understand what has come before us, there's a ton of new scholarship every day. I can't keep up with it. You know, Prabhaka Singh is publishing every day. I can't even keep up with him. Um, well, as they say, you know, the genie is out of the bottle. Eurocentric accounts of international legal history have been solidly upended. As the just ended symposium on teaching and researching international law, global perspectives on Afronomics law co-sponsored with the National University of Singapore Center of International Law shows, discussions of international law and international legal history no longer are no longer simply north-south top-down debates. Rather, as Anthony Angi observed at the conclusion of that symposium uh, last week, the axes of debate are shifting, particularly in the manner in which international legal scholarship is produced and validated. Is still perhaps the new mainstream? 
This seminar series is a good example of the continuing democratization in the production of international legal scholarship, and I applaud you for it. So thank you very much. Thank you, James, for that extremely insightful and illuminating presentation. Uh, only you could have summarized in such a short period of time, not only the key features of Dwell uh, historical scholarship, but also the gaps and uh, also uh, in your response to the criticism that this scholarship uh, is, uh, is uh, receiving. So thank you so much for that presentation. Uh, I think I'll first allow uh, uh, those who are listening in, uh, you know, uh, to ask their uh, questions. So can I request uh, Prabhakar Singh to, uh, uh, Professor Prabhakar Singh to uh, uh, read out some of the questions that are being, that have been asked uh, for the convenience of Professor Gati. Yes, sir. So the first, so there are two questions from uh, Professor Sagnik Das from Jindal Global Law School. His first question is, I'm wondering whether the turn to historicization of international law, while doubtlessly significant in the twill scholarship context, may have come at the cost of missing out on the opportunity to seriously engage with particular doctrinal tenets of international law. That's his first question. His second question is, I'm wondering in the context of method, whether Twail's agenda necessarily must issue intellectual histories in favor of a more long durée telling of history. These are the two questions. Okay, so uh, thank you. Um, um, you'll have maybe to repeat the second question, but uh, on, the, on the first, uh, whether uh, the turn to history uh, sacrifices uh, examining a uh, doctrine, which is sort of the staple of international legal scholarship and practice. Um, you know, I think that, uh, first of all, I would say that, uh, you know, twill scholarship is very vast. Uh, it is extremely vast. And I, I don't know of any twill scholarship that doesn't deal or examine uh, uh, doctrine in international law. In fact, the very foundation of Twill doctrine, of Twill scholarship, uh, is, is covering the same terrain that the mainstream covers, uh, that uh, as Bupinda Chimney in his book argues, is the very thing that uh, scholars like Mati Koskiniemi's powerful scholarship does by using the same materials in international law uh, to uncover its limitations. Um, and it's the same thing that 12 scholars do. They are not going outside of doctrine. And in fact, the, the entire part of a critical approach to international of, 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 of 12 scholarship is to argue very strongly against the purely doctrinal positivist approach uh, by uncovering what is uh, as I remember saying as a graduate student, being hidden under the carpet, you know, what is not being said? Uh, what other roles uh, would law be playing? Uh, so there, you know, it's, it's not an either or uh, between doctrine and, uh, and history. Uh, so, I, I mean, let me just give you an example. Uh, you know, one of my very early articles uh, examined an international court of justice case uh, between uh, Namibia and Botswana, the Kaskili Sedudu case. And in that case, uh, I was trying to uncover uh, how the international court of justice arrived at its decision in demarcating the boundary uh, between those two countries based on colonial treaties. and the limitations of both uh, the, uh, the opinion of the court, uh, uh, of the opinion of the court in particular, uh, was the way in which I could show, I showed, and that article I think is published in the Leiden Journal of International Law, you can look at it. Uh, I was able to show the limitations of the opinion of the court uh, in not 
finding anything in international law to take into account the use and occupation of the territory in question by the African peoples who occupied it. The fact that the Masubian people who there was evidence on the record as to their use and occupation of the territory could not be taken into account in any way by the court in arriving its decision is just mind bending. Uh, it, it would take you to really accept the Kool-Aid of international law that uh, you don't take into account evidence that confronts or opposes or undermines in any way the major precepts, the major uh, assumptions uh, of international law. So that the work of Twill scholarship as uh, Judge Waramantri in that case, in his separate opinion showed, uh, is to try and uncover uh, those hidden logics of international law that make it impossible to acknowledge a different telling uh, of international law. So I see from my perspective, no opposition between the doctrine and the history. They are one and the same thing, unless your starting assumption is the doctrine is just the rules and that the rules are pure, you know, um, and, and have nothing to do with the history and have no legacy and they are completely separated from any context um, uh, that I reject. Um, the second question, uh, prop, yes. Proper, uh, yes. Yeah. I, I will. I will repeat the second question. Before that, um, just to uh, just for the benefit of our audience, the article that Professor Gathi was mentioning uh, is called "Geographical uh, Hegelianism," published in the Leiden Journal of International Law in 2006. Uh, the second question from Sagnik Das is: I'm wondering, in the context of method whether Twail's agenda necessarily must eschew international histories in favor of a more long durée telling of history. Okay, I'm not sure that I completely understand the question, uh, but I, I think I would say that uh, there, there isn't really a one Twail uh, uh, retelling of international legal history. Um, you know, Bupinda Chimney's uh, uh, very powerful recent article in the American Journal of International Law, uh, the only Twill article to be published in that journal, unfortunately, uh, tracing the history of uh, the rise of capitalism contemporaneous with the rise of customer international law uh, is quite distinctive uh, and original, as well as is Tony Angie's retelling of the history of international law using the dynamic of difference. Um, and just, I'm just using those two as examples of uh, the different types of international legal history represented in the large umbrella of Twail. Um, and therefore, I, I'm not sure that uh, I uh, high on uh, sort of uh, the idea of method, uh, because when I think about the idea of method, for example, in this specific context, as I said, with reference to my sort of response to the critique of anachronism, often method is a way of limiting uh, the kind of ambitious scholarship that tries to uncover new things that are not part of the conversation in the discipline. So, you might say, I might for say in conclusion in answer to your, uh, to your uh, question, Twill offers a new method, a different method or different types of method for doing international legal scholarship. Now, doesn't mean that Twill doesn't have its limitations. Uh, every method does. Uh, every method is able to do one thing but may not be able to do other things. And you know, so I completely acknowledge there are limitations with the twelve method. Uh, in it, powerfully does certain things, um, and there are other things that it may not be able to do that other methods might be able to do. Thank you, Professor Gathi. The next question is also from um, a Jindal faculty member Aman from our Jindal Global Law School. His question is: In your Grotius lecture. This year, you spoke about uh, this promise. You spoke to how people like Fakri, Okafor, Raja Gopal take prominent positions of responsibility. It would be great if you could speak more 
about this promise and how we can hope it will be more visible as we go. So, um, one of the central twill tenets is that twill is very critical of international law for all the reasons that we've covered. Uh, but twill is simultaneously very hopeful of using international law for quote unquote transformative projects. So every time I read a twill scholar, uh, whether it's um, a scholar from Latin America in the 19th century, Carlos Calvo or uh, a contemporary twill scholar, uh, I'm always struck by the combination of both critique and hope. The best way I can summarize uh, the combination of critique and hope uh, is by borrowing from our friends, the critical race theorists here in America, here in the United States, uh, who uh, have a very powerful critique of domestic law uh, for uh, and the subordination of African Americans and other people of color on the one hand, but also very powerfully appealing to rights as a possible corrective to the subordination of African Americans here in the United States. So Kimberly Crenshaw calls this reform and retrenchment. And the way that I've translated this in the 12 context is to argue, for example, we got developing countries, former colonized countries got their right to self-determination. And therefore they were freed from alien racist colonial rule, alien colonial rule. That did not end all the vestiges of colonialism and imperialism many of the elites of the post-colonial world uh, became partners with multinational capital and Western states uh, in depreding their states, the corrupt elites, what Bupinda Chimney calls transnational capitalist, the transnational capitalist class. But at the same time, they got independence, political independence uh, that they didn't enjoy before uh, from uh, alien racists and colonial rule. Of course, they use this new independence as we have uh, discussed today uh, to repress domestic populations like the indigenous peoples as uh, Judge Joel Ngugi of the High Court of Kenya tells us in the Kenyan context and so on and so forth. Uh, so I think that uh, it's important to uh, work uh, behind the enemy lines as, uh, uh, as uh, Abisab, George's Abisab, Judge George's Abisab reminds us. Uh, and I see the work that's being done by 12 scholars, practitioners like Tendaya Chiume, uh, who is a special rapporteur uh, on racism and xenophobia in the United Nations as uh, Michael Fakri, the rapporteur on the right to food, uh, Obiara Okafor, also a UN uh, special rapporteur, and there are many others who are practicing international law. I think that uh, there is no opposition uh, in being critical and bringing that critical impulse into the work uh, and practice of international law whether it's at the international level, at the global level, at the regional level, uh, we need those practitioners uh, who are bringing those ideas to uh, the important work that is happening in those scenarios. Uh, the practice of international law should not be reserved only for uh, particular types of expertise, uh, the types of expertise that should participate in shaping international law, whether it's at the practice level in government or international organizations. I think should reflect the richness of the conversations that we are seeing in the scholarship. Um, the next question is uh, from Professor Rashmi Raman from the Center for International Legal Studies. Her question is, 
could Professor Gathi please engage with the learning from this recently concluded excellent series of essays published in Afroeconomics in collaboration with NUS Law, specifically on his thoughts of teaching international law in the classroom. How do we use TWIL not just to challenge the mainstream agenda of curriculum, but to sub supplant it or more radically transform the teaching learning space? Thank you. Yeah, that's a very important question. And I, you know, I think Professor Chimney would be great to uh, uh, sort of chime in here. I, I would say that I think what um, the question really is getting at is, is when a new law school is established, I see, especially in the Commonwealth world, I see deans rushing to the UK and spending millions of pounds to buy Malcolm Show and all those books that uh, everybody was talking about in the symposium uh, that uh, Afronomics Law and uh, the National University of Singapore Center for International Law uh, ran over the last three weeks. Uh, and you know, this came from a very important exercise that uh, the teaching and researching international law in Asia network, the Trilla network did, which I think is a really uh, important and formidable counterpoint, uh, not just to uh, mainstream international law, but to the publishing houses, uh, because the publishing houses are raking millions of pounds and dollars from third world schools. I mean, you go to the remotest law school in Africa, you'll find a Malcolm Show book, but you never, you'll not find a book by Bupinda Chimney or by Anthony Angi or by uh, any of the Twelas, Liliane Obregon. I, I think that uh, part of this, the challenge here is the, um, the fact that we Twelas have to stop being lazy and really engage in producing um, the case books and the materials and to work as hard as those publishing houses have worked to get the market share uh, that they have in recycling uh, books of international law that don't even reflect the most current mainstream accounts of international law. But I think I want to sort of invite Professor Chimney because uh, unlike me, he actually has been doing this in the global south. Please unmute, please. Uh, I could not agree with you more, James, that uh, I think we need to stop being lazy and produce uh, uh, what we uh, in India call textbooks on international law from a 12 uh, perspective. It has been my own ambition for a very long time. And uh, in fact, one can write the genealogy of this very idea, <laughs> which began with uh, two decades ago with, uh, when my own teacher, Professor Anand, was still uh, actively teaching. Uh, but I think it's, uh, uh, it's one of those tasks which has to be accomplished. If we have to reach out to, uh, we, if, we have to uh, if, if we have to expand our reach uh, so far as uh, law schools are concerned, uh, because otherwise what happens is that uh, while, uh, uh, while twelve scholarship does find a presence in one form or another, but the substantial teaching is done through the mainstream textbooks. And once you get socialized into thinking uh, through the mainstream textbook, uh, the, the critical approach is simply an ad, becomes an add-on that you're familiar with that approach. But when you're asked to do scholarship or when you're asked uh, to give uh, counsel or advice, you tend to go back to the go back to the uh, go back to the mainstream uh, 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 textbook. But uh, a beginning has been made uh, in terms of reflecting on teaching and research. I think uh, a Trila is a uh, is a an, uh, is a great initiative, and it's all uh, you know it it's already. Uh, 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 undertaken path breaking activities in uh, in asia and the collaboration with uh, 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 with james I, I, I think is going to prove very productive so in short i, I mean this is something we can you know one can speak on 
uh, at length, but my sense is that some of us or one of us simply should take this ta task on of producing, a, uh, you know, and it doesn't have to be the perfect textbook. Uh, it, as we know, there's enormous diversity in Twill. So whichever standpoint that appeals to the individual writing this, but we need to produce a textbook. Uh, otherwise we are going to become uh, a footnote as best a passage uh, mainstream. And this is not our destiny alone. This is the destiny of feminist scholarship. This is the destiny of, uh, you know, the new approaches to international law. Uh, I think, in fact, perhaps we get more footnote space than somebody like David Kennedy gets. And so this is our collective, the collective destiny of critical scholarship. And learn, I think, uh, I hope in the next uh, couple of years, some of us can uh, get together to produce that text. Uh, but it's a great idea, James. I, I entirely share your uh, concern. Uh, the next question is from uh, Surendra Kumar, a faculty at Jindal Global Law School, to Professor Gati. Uh, do you reconcile work of Antia Roberts? Is international law international? Does it not further the understanding that international law is more locational rather than universal, which undergirds the legitimacy of international law? Well, um, so that's a good question. You know, I, I, you know, first of all, I think you know the the idea that there are regional particularities is, um, to say the least, obvious. Uh, so, I when I my critique of comparative international law is when comparative international law is presented. In fact, let me rephrase that. My view is the mainstream is happy to receive comparative international law because comparative international law brings brown and black faces and yellow faces, whatever, the non-white faces uh, to uh, the... Uh, 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 but I think a twill approach is not merely a regional approach. This is the critique of 12 feminists to white feminists from the North, the global North, that uh, feminism doesn't look the same everywhere. But in fact, that it's a much more radical critique, just like uh, the 12 critique of mainstream accounts of international lawyers, which is to say that um, the 12, <laughs> scholarship asks very uncomfortable questions uh, about international law, its role, its history, that a regional approach doesn't. So in my own work on international legal history in Africa, I contrast two approaches. Uh, and the basic question that this um, international legal history is trying to respond to is sort of the Hegelian view of Africa as a historical, no consciousness, you know, uh, no history, didn't own land. Uh, it's basically the story embracing international law. So one response uh, by Judge Elias uh, Olawale, who became a president of the International Court of Justice is what I call contributionism. Well, wait a minute, Africa actually did contribute to the making of international law. And this is how, you know, I can show you all these empires and the commercial routes uh, between Europe and Africa that shows some inter internationality and therefore the African personality um, is very much like the European personality. We sort of participate in the making of international law. Uh, then he says, well, colonialism was just a small interlude, a footnote uh, in which the sovereignty of Africa was suspended only for a little while. So that's one approach. The second approach is a more critical approach, a more twill approach, you know, which says, uh, well, actually the history of colonialism is so foundational to understanding Africa's place 
in the world today. And you and in international law, you couldn't understand uh, why Africa was regarded as an unconscious geographical entity with no sovereignty, unless you understand the nature of colonial rule and what colonial rule was all about. Completely different uh, take. And I, I think that the more critical approach to international law, therefore, in uh, sort of uh, hits more uh, uh, the kind of uh, points that are missed by the contributionists, you know, who are more the sort of, I would argue, sort of taking a regional sort of perspective, you know, and a, a perspective about the, the what both the uniqueness of Africa, but also the way that Africa is similar to the West and therefore completely ignoring or erasing or not engaging with uh, Africa's subordinate position in uh, uh, both the retelling of the story of international law, but also in the international political economy. So, um, um, you know, I think that sort of talking about uh, uh, regionalism uh, has its value, uh, but um, its value, I think, is 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 cannot cannot sort of uh, always sort of uh, address uh, the uh, much more, I guess, um, uh, complicated history uh, of subordination that uh, uh, a twelve perspective is able to show. Thank you, Professor Gatti. The next question is from Akhil Rana. Um, he asks, what role, what role does TWIL have, not for international law making, but rather in international law implementation? <laughs> um, so uh, I have, uh, is, if you're interested in this topic, uh, my, my forthcoming book is on Africa's international courts. This is Cambridge University Press, Oxford University Press, uh, it's uh, titled something like, uh, I forget what the title is. Um, uh, and if you really want to know how activists and opposition political parties and uh, opposition leaders in Africa are implementing international law, read that book. It's not just about resistance. It's not just about compliance. It's not just about effectiveness, as the mainstream tells us. Uh, I tell a very, in my view, a very compelling story uh, about the way in which international law is used and mobilized uh, in ways that are often invisible uh, in mainstream accounts. If you only focus on compliance, if you only focus on effectiveness, uh, it's a book that I've edited with uh, lots of uh, African authors uh, who are, in my view, leading a new generation of scholarship answering that very, very, very question, uh, but departing from the assumptions that, uh, uh, that dominate the thinking about the implementation of rules of international law in our discipline. The last question of the session is from Aman, again from Jindal Global Law School, a faculty here. His question is, is TWAIL or any other critical approach somewhere apprehensive that it may also create a set of its own elites? Any thought of how this is something that can be prevented or has been prevented. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, I, I think it's quite clear that uh, as, as also Chimney referred uh, to in sort of one of these responses, you know, Twill is very self-conscious and very self-critical. Uh, and I am a scholar based in the global north. Uh, so I may be one of the very transnational capitalist elites that Chimney writes about in his, uh, in his work. Uh, so yes, uh, it, that could very well be true. I mean, there's been similar uh, discussions in post-colonial studies and uh, subaltern studies in, uh, uh, with scholars uh, based in North America and in Europe. Uh, so I'm not saying, and I have not suggested in this uh, discussion, that twill is uh, the holy grail, that it's above all the critique. No, I don't think it's not the high noon. It doesn't solve all the problems, uh, but it's a very important perspective. 
that brings new insights into international law and that I think uh, ought to be much more uh, uh, well known, especially in the global south, as Bupinda Chimney said. So thank you very much for this opportunity. I really enjoyed this discussion. Unfortunately, time moves very fast. Uh, permit me to sort of thank you uh, with all my heart uh, for taking time off, James, for speaking to us. I hope there'll be other occasions because I found your remarks today, uh, uh, you know, uh, really inspiring uh, in terms of uh, looking at the success of TWIL. And on the other hand, you have set us uh, all a range of tasks that we need to uh, collectively undertake to take the TWIL project forward. Uh, so heartfelt thanks, sincere thanks, James. And we hope to have you again back on, uh, uh, you know, on one of these webinars to talk to us in other fields of international law. Thank you so much, James. Thank you so much. Deeply. Thank you. With that, we will uh, close uh, our uh, today's session uh, and we invite you to join for our other sessions that will happen next week. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Thanks, people. Thanks uh, for the invitation.